<laughs> Welcome, everybody. Densely crowded, overflow capacity. <laughs> we have the biggest room. Yeah. So we're very important. We want the biggest audience. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, a few more people will trickle in, but let's not wait for them. Uh, I'd also suggest that maybe we change our format a little bit. Uh, I've seen a lot of panels where we, uh, uh, the different panelists present one by one in trait, trait, freight train fashion. Uh, let's try to mix that up just a little bit. I would suggest that after every panelist, we have a few minutes for a pressing question. We, we'll gather most of the questions for the end of the session, but let's interrupt a little bit. Be a little transgressive here. Uh, this is, after all, supposedly revolution. And uh, my name is Michael Meyer. I'm your, your host. This is Popular Resistance and the Media, a topic I'm looking forward to very much because I've been through lots of revolutions. I'm a former correspondent and editor for Newsweek. Uh, my first job was uh, as a uh, Newsweek's reporter in Central and Eastern Europe, Germany in 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down and dominoes came toppling in short order ever after. Um, and then I, when I moved from Newsweek in 2007 to join Ban Ki-moon as his communications director at the United Nations. And as you all know, the Arab Spring burst upon us in 2010-2011. And it was fascinating. And this, I'm, I'm so interested to hear what you all have to say, because I'm the guy who had to try to figure out what was going on in this thing that we called the Arab Spring. And, you know, the UN political department came up with lots of jargon, but zero insight, which is your own window on perhaps the United Nations. Um, but I didn't find analyses from the CIA or the, the Jim and Bayon Day or anybody else to be... Um, a lot more insightful. And so I found myself almost every day going into social media to figure out what was happening in Tunisia, for starters, and then moving on to, to Syria. And Ban Ki-moon, a South Korean diplomat, is a very circumspect man. His tenure is coming to an end at the end of this year. He was an extremely able diplomat, an extremely able secretary general but very cautious and hardly as incandescently charismatic as Kofi Annan. I think you'll agree, Kofi Annan could read the phone book and make it sound like Shakespeare. <laughs> My guy could not. <laughs> Let me read this sentence here. Oh, I will get that in a moment. So, difference in style. But um, at one point, he began, he wanted to speak out. And we began, we, we began speaking out with atypical candor and strength as time went on. And then came a day when we had to really decide what to do about Syria. Do we denounce the regime or do we not stay mum but be more circumspect than the Secretary General himself wanted to be? And why was that? Because it was a trade-off. You could say something now and you would alienate the regime forever. And then, down the road, if a diplomatic window opened, you would not be in the position to take advantage. So we had to, decide, had to decide whether to go forward and be outspoken. And then, as we did, and who would step in when the diplomatic opportunity materialized, if it ever did. And we decided then and there who it would be. Kofi Annan. And you know, there's no love lost between the previous Secretary General and the current one, I can, I can tell you. But there was only one person who could probably handle a, a, a negotiation of that order of magnitude. But all along the way, as we were calibrating our language, we weren't looking at traditional media. We were gauging the temper of social media and trying to figure out what was going on the ground ourselves. The little team around Ban Ki-moon, not the whole departments of analysts, and we were going right to the source, which tells you a lot about the power of the media that I hope we will discuss this afternoon. So, in order in which they'll speak, I'll give very introductions. You all have the, uh, the program. Uh, this is uh, Roxanne Farman Farmanfarian, correct? Great. You have to be courageous. Uh, be courageous. <laughs> Here on my left. Is my left, is it not? Yes. And um, she will talk about youth 
mediapreneurship in Tunisia, Morocco, and Turkey. In other words, web resistance 2.0. My life was web resistance 1.0. It was very indirect. So this is going to be an interesting insight, I suspect, into the, the evolution of the media. Um, in the center, we have uh, Otarid Haidar, who's a uh, uh, lecturer at, at Oxford. And she'll be speaking on uh, civic society and civil society in the Syrian war, in the media in Syria, I, I, I presume. And on the, uh, my far left is uh, uh, Bahar Joya, who's also from Oxford, fellow at the Reuters Institute, and I believe a former BBC journalist. Am I, am I right there? Oh, still I am. Still you are? Yes. Excellent. So she's unlike me. She's not a lapsed journalist. Um, and she will be talking about the impact of social media on Afghanistan's social taboos. And I have a very close friend at the New York Times who covers Afghanistan, Rod Nordland, who I suspect you know, and has written <laughs> some fairly compelling books on social media and taboos, particularly uh, honor marriages. And so I'd like to throw myself into this a little bit, if you don't mind. So with that, uh, uh, Roxanne, would you like to kick us off? It wasn't a technology. That's fine. Thank you very much for having me and uh, for uh, and to the Al Khan University for uh, hosting this. And I wanted to thank Jonathan for all of the technology help. You've been great. Um, for the past three years, I'm also going to just put this on in case. Is it that one? Um, for the past three years, I've been running a research project. Uh, called Media and Political Transition. It is funded by Al Jazeera. It has nothing to do with Al Jazeera. It is the only case of a broadcaster in the Middle East funding an academic program uh, as any other funder would completely off-site. The particular focus of, this, of the study has been uh, the uh, southern Mediterranean and eastern Mediterranean, if you will, Turkey, uh, Tunisia and Morocco. Um, Tunisia, of course, triggered the Arab Spring, uh, uprisings as I prefer to call them, with demonstrations falling from Morocco to Yemen. And two years later, there were in Turkey the Gezi Park demonstrations, uh, with primarily in all cases youth passionately demanding government change and transparency and an end to corruption. These movements not only use tra traditional forms of activism, demonstrations and placards and speeches, but they used, as we all know, social media to organize and to report and conduct citizen journalism, which became really important during that time, highlighting the self-censorship that was going on by the conventional media and broadcasting their own messages, not only internally, but into an international sphere. These demonstrations, uh, I am going to argue tonight, were training grounds, not only for political activism, but for what we are calling mediapreneurship. What I'm going to go into is a counter-narrative of the depressed, post-Arab uprising youth who are uh, without hope and activity. This is about those that are charging forward and making a difference. Media in the hands of the under 30s via the internet, Twitter, and Facebook, and YouTube, and local blogs, and via mobile through text exchanges, and video exchanges, and photo exchanges, gave people information, and it empowered them at the same time. The experience was transformational. Um, many of these students and now uh, post-students are uh, consistently pushing the borders of the conscience in their countries, pushing for change, and mediating the culture and ideas as well as politics. 
The media they use has helped pro reproblemize both the message, the audience, and the public sphere. Now, theoretically, we have structured this according to three areas of frameworks. One is Isaiah Berlin's negative and positive freedoms. Um, a second one is internal political efficacy. And the third is political opportunity. And I will go into these uh, in a little bit more detail. Isaiah Berlin's uh, looks at negative freedom as freedom from. Freedom from authoritarian control. Freedom from interference. And that obviously <coughs> was the first step that, this, that everybody went through. And at the same time is positive freedom, which is the opportunity to exercise your own narrative, your own self-mastery. And obviously, in any society, one needs to balance both. There have to be limits, in fact, on both sides. And a society which has uh, a media that recognizes itself and the norms of the society is one that very much is able to balance those two. That is an ideal. We all struggle for this at different times in different ways. And the great choice that we see in that is where does power then have an effect? Who gets the freedom to decide what is freedom of expression? Um, briefly, the, um, oh, I can go into this a little bit more. The internal political efficacy argument is that internal political efficacy is a predictor of conventional political participation. In other words, it's how much people feel as though they can influence politics and perceive themselves as doing so. And related to this, of course, directly, is the idea of empowerment. People gain political empowerment through their involvement and a sense of control over their lives and the narrative that surrounds them. The positive effects that uh, percep perception of their own capability to influence social and political systems is what we call internal political efficacy. So we see that during this period there was a transformational processes that were going on. Demonstrators broke down the barriers of fear and they developed their own sense of uh, influence over uh, social and political systems. They became involved very much through the media that they used that enabled that involvement. And this led to a rising influence over events and had a positive political effect on uh, the responses they were receiving and hence their impression of the efficacy of collective action. And of course, these are circular and series effects. They used mediated uh, collective action to gain local political momentum, which of course then translated into international awareness of what was happening. And the outcome then was both personal and collective political empowerment. And the acquisition very critically of new political skills. In other words, they, gave, they got better at it. They came to realize what worked and what didn't. And what emerged from the demonstrations was a higher sense of their own influence and their, their commitment, therefore, that because they were feeling empowered, they were getting those responses, they could drive change through the media's uh, instrumentalization. And this, I argue, has translated into multiple examples of media entrepreneurship that is continuing today. Briefly about political opportunity. Oh, what happened to my slide? It's gone. OK, so let me quickly go into political opportunity. The definition of that basically is a presentation of something advantageous in terms of a circumstance at a time that activism actually is prepared to take advantage of it. These come in two forms. There's the shock value of a certain political opportunity, such as the self-immolation in Tunisia or the sudden desire of the government in, in Turkey to reconfigure a public park and put a, uh, a mall, a, a shopping center in that. That is revolutionary type of political opportunity. The people that then respond have often been building up some time in advance. Something is able to trigger it and uh, a sudden change takes place. 
There is a second type of political opportunity, and that is the much more evolutionary type. It's when there are times of uncertainty or disorientation in which political transition is required, but it, what it requires is new ideas, new techniques, new technologies, new ideas, and of course, new leadership. And when voices from below can finally really be heard, but often in a trickle type of way, so often it is unnoticed by the sensational reportage, for example, at any given time in the media. And that's very much what we see having followed the Arab Spring, having followed the Turkish uh, uprisings, although Turkey certainly continues to surprise and awe us at every turn. I'm going to quickly look, just for the sake of some context, at Tunisia before, during, and after the revolution, just to show where it's got, come from. Um, it doesn't mean that these are exactly the same to the other states, but it gives a sense of what the situation was from which these young entrepreneurs began. So in uh, Tunisia, before the revolution, the government surveillance was uh, ex extensive. Throughout the uh, media, conventional media, it was completely controlled. It was heavily controlled in the internet, but it was so ridiculously presented at times that the surveillance, the degree of WTTP error 404 that would show up, started getting a nickname. And the nickname was Amar, which you can see there. And Amar in Arabic is, is sort of something that's really cool. So this thing would show up and everybody would be spoofing at it because it's so uncool to censor other things. So you can see that the um, this would come up and they started having posters of it and all sorts of things about it. And they would get around it using server proxies, all different kinds of social networking that would go, tweeting with uh, sta uh, other states all the way to Holland, for example, and back again. And so information dominance simply was escaping from uh, the regime. What took place during the, the uh, uprisings was the rise of some incredibly uh, potent citizen journalists, a lot of bloggers. There was the celebrity blogger syndrome that developed, the Tunisian girl, Lina Ben Meni, who became a nominee for the Nobel Prize, for example. And there was Slim Anamu, who became uh, the first minister of youth and sport after the elected government in 2011. And they became, they and others, became the revolution's actually celebrity journalists. Um, once the revolution took place, Benadi flees, there is a sense consistently in Tunisia today that one of the most important things that they've achieved is truly freedom of expression. And what happened when Benadi left was that suddenly censorship literally overnight evaporated. Self-censorship was no longer uh, relevant, and a great deal of the same kind of things the bloggers could say, now people in the uh, universities, I mean in the uh, conventional media could say, television changed overnight. It was, as the head of La, uh, La Presse put it, an unexpected liberation. And certainly, uh, as you can see from Amel, you know, this was something that many journalists had aspired to. Finally, they got it. It was a period of euphoria, what Berlin would have described as freedom from, as well as freedom to. But it started to overstep a number of red lines. People started becoming concerned that it was a free-for-all, that it was being used as a uh, as a way to air too many uh, forms of anger and settle scores, and it was undignified, and dignity was a huge aspect, of course, of the Arab Spring. It, it was even ungodly and certainly crass. And so we see that new red lines began to narrow freedom of expression, some imposed from below through uh, public response and others from above, from the newly elected government that was not quite sure how to handle this, but was very worried about the accountability. And so this cause for unrest, for worry, then becomes freedom of expression for whom? 
So there were several red lines. One, of course, uh, very quickly became religious sensibility. For the second time, we see Persepolis mentioned in this conference. Uh, Nesma TV uh, aired the, the movie. There was a huge Salafist uh, uprising. This, uh, they threatened to torch the TV station. And this certainly put a damper on the idea of uh, being able to show God, for example, which was the problem uh, as the depiction of a person, and many other sensibilities within the, the religious expression became narrowed as fines and trials um, ensued. Similarly, uh, when blogger Jaber Metri posted cartoons of the Prophet on Facebook in 2012, he received a seven-year prison sentence. Um, other red lines, social de decency and public um, uh, dignity. The, uh, one of the big newspapers at Tunisia runs a uh, picture taken from GQ uh, of a Tunisian footballer with his almost bare German girlfriend. Again, trials, there's a, a, a um, um, hunger strike as the editor tries to, to exercise self-mastery. Um, and also the state security system is another red line, particularly as terrorism starts taking off and there is uh, assassinations in the courts, I mean in the streets, and um, the number of attacks by the, by the, the authorities rises whenever there is a, a major press event. And again, in the courts, blogger Yasmin Ayari is tried for defaming the army on Facebook after criticizing the defense minister in 2013 and gets a three-year absentee um, prison sentence. Post-crisis political me uh, media entrepreneurship uh, in uh, the Southern Med now is something I'll look at against this background. These are the kinds of things certainly that have happened in Morocco and certainly um, after um, uh, afterwards in Turkey. And I'm going to have to rush because I've got I've, I've spoken too long already. Um, La Henda was a, a multi-tasker, uh, as so many of the bloggers and uh, users of social media were. Uh, the use of the internet and mobile has skyrocketed in the, in the Arab world just during this period. I won't go into all the statistics. Many of them you probably know. But uh, internet use literally doubled, tripled during this period as the use of Facebook and mobile social media. In Turkey, over half the population is reported using social media. Um, social media changed society through three different ways, what I call asabia, which is very much the uh, sort of network of family and friends uh, that is so trusted in um, in uh, the Middle East, and one of the reasons social media takes off so well, you can, I won't belabor it, but you can see that people are using social media as often as they are using, the young people particularly, as often as they're using television or personal exchange for information. Um, there, uh, this is an example of the use of Twitter in, uh, in Istanbul. And in Morocco, for example, is because the current, um, political party is so much, PJD is so much better at running the social media sites that they've won in many ways, it's been a major reason why they've won the election both last time and this time. And you can see where the, the primary source of news is little by little getting uh, to be social media is increasingly the go-to place. So there's been a, a explosion of online youth generated news sites, uh, many of them watchdog, and I will go through these quite quickly. I don't think we'll have time to go live on any of them. Um, but in many ways, because they're quick, because they have commentary, because there's an element of uh, honed skill sets, they're thought of as much more credible still than a lot of the conventional media, and I think that's really important to know. So uh, Tunisia Live, if you were looking at Tunisia online from, at the time with Ban Ki-moon, this would have been one of the ones that you would have looked at. So they started, we see the launch of English language news by young people 
so that it didn't have to be translated. It could be picked up right away by the international uh, press and broadcasting. Tunisia Live also runs the only who's who of everybody that's anybody in Tunisia. Uh, Morocco World News, the same thing. Very young people. They've got a very iffy uh, um, a, you know, business model, but they're hanging in there and trying to do the same thing. Now that uh, reflects a completely different model. This is activism where they're teaching activists to be journalists. You can see they broadcast in, or they, they, they have sites that are running French, Arabic, and English. They have uh, all sorts of portals and statistics and were active from the time of the revolution and have gone through several different staffs and uh, they've definitely cleaned up their site and it looks so professional. In Turkey, you've got 140 journos. You can see it's gone from its younger sense of its little bird to now rather a dangerous looking one. They also have set up a, uh, an app. Uh, 140 journos is um, also a, a sort of doing, um, it was founded by a 21 year old college student uh, and it calls itself counter media. It considers itself more a data project of journalism run by um, collecting a lot of uh, crowdsourcing of data in order to provide better information than anybody else on elections, on where people are actually voting. Was there really anybody in the streets actually the night that the, that the coup took place? Actually, there weren't very many. There were a lot the next morning. Look at what uh, uh, 140 journals will, re will report. In Morocco, there's Le Desk. That is run by a number of young but experienced journalists who have been in a number of different sites, one after another getting closed down. These are definitely increasingly authoritarian states, but they keep coming back. Ledesk's most recent approach has been to do it by subscription so that they can argue they're not generally available to the larger uh, area. On the other hand, what happens is their investigative reporting gets picked up and tweeted and projected through other ways. Two more. Uh, Balsala, I had this um, live, but I don't have enough time. They changed the entire constitutional process as the constitution was being written in Tunisia. They slipped into, this is the, uh, the representative house. It was absolutely closed. They slipped in as guests, started taking pictures, set up the uh, that where people were sitting, noticed that half the people weren't showing up, started doing pictures of how nobody was there, created a huge scandal that the people that are supposed to be writing the Constitution aren't even coming. And boy, did they start coming. And they didn't get reelected, a number of them. And they uncovered a number of scandals like that. They brought the, the uh, representative articles out to the countryside and had debates. Well, that's and how back. long is your life? Yeah. Uh, it's not even, well, do you want to just call it what they would do? It's not as, it's not as, but what they would do is they would highlight, you would find that, slow down just a second, they would, yeah, highlight, they would give the entire electoral um, uh, attendance, what they'd done, what they said, uh, what they said they were going to do and support, and in fact what they were supporting. So they just made it 3D. And, um, and, and when they, you do things like highlight any of these, it will show that you know day after day after day, X guy didn't show up. So that, that was Balasala. It was, uh, again, young people, a number of them have gone back to university at Georgetown or whatever, a number of new people have moved in. Has Express, um, yeah. Finishing up, actually, I'm going to make this. Um, so we've got, uh, so the next, oh, I'm doing the next one. Uh, Intifada, the first real investigative magazine online. Again, young people, they have um, done this extraordinary terrorism map. Again, I'm not going to do it live, but it goes back, oh, well, I guess I am, 2011. And if you scroll down, you can see that there's no, yeah, so it tells you all of these. There's nobody there, and if you go all the way to the bottom, it'll you know you can see that little tiny thing, and then if you just go right to the very bottom of this, down to 
2000, you can see they're beginning to grow. So it's interactive. This is the terrorism that has taken place, and you can see where it is. And then it gives the particular coverage, and it tells you how many um, Tunisian military have died and how many uh, uh, terrorists, quote unquote, have died and where it's taken place. These um, are the police, and these are the terrorists. So that it gives you a sense. And they're updating that. They do all sorts of counter uh, veiling reportage a little uh, bit like buzz stream. And finally, and I'm just about to finish up there. I'm on my last Great, 30 seconds. Great, because I got this little sign. Yes, yeah, okay. Is um, Hespress, oh, so Platform 24, again, it's a, it's a Turkish one uh, that's, that's focused on the media. So it's a very high, you know, these days they just uh, shut down Cumhuriyet, which is the major opposition newspaper. Somehow, Platform 24 has continued and covers all the different uh, media stories. Hespress is actually closer to the, the Moroccan monarchy than a number of other counteractive ones, but it does such good journalism that it basically is outstripping or outclassing all the others, and it runs a thematic comments uh, every month that brings together all the comments. So although it's pro-court, it actually will carry the comments of the people that respond to it. And then we all know the counter rhetoric that also takes place, the mystery tweeters in Turkey, where there seemed to be somebody right in the cabinet that was reporting on every single new newspaper that was being shut down or, or reporter that was getting uh, arrested. And in Morocco, another mystery tweeter, Chris Coleman, that uh, was adding a counter narrative, which gives all based on material that was actually factual, and so we see that the new this new political elite is mobile, it's distributed, and it's global, which is the very elements of what makes for social media today. Roxanne, <laughs> stay up there a moment. Wow, that was a tour de force. Um, does anyone have a question on this? Very provocative presentation, because if you don't, I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. It's, it's more of a commentary rather than question. There might be a question, but it's there somewhere. That's fine. Um, I just wanted to kind of remind ourselves of what happened in July in, in Turkey. Oh, and, and recently. And No, no just specifically about the so-called coup mm. and the, the role of media in that was, I think, fascinating yeah, at various levels. Um, if you remember, the rebels, so-called rebels, coup plotters, whatever, they had taken over TRT. Yes. Yeah? And they, they announced that uh, change of the regime. Of minutes. course, not many people watch TRT. But they were still thinking kind of old, old uh, school. The president actually uses CNN Turk, an American <coughs> agency, and he's very critical of America, and he goes on FaceTime through that channel, and then he evokes a very old Roman empire, imperial tradition. He asks people to go out on the squares, the mosques start getting active. So at various levels, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, this kind of old tradition of communication. You're actually parking people to go take over the squares. And you're using latest technology, Apple in this case, and CNN, and you're criticizing America. <laughs> so I mean, it all. It, so, so well, probably what you said at the end, this global dimension. So, so um, you, I've got a question that maybe is, is, so just is, comment. is, is, such a big comment, is, is comp complementary to that. Give us a, a just a, a very quick, because we're turning to our next pres presenter, a very quick snapshot of of where we are now, because. In the early days of the Arab Spring, everyone could be a blogger without a great deal of penalty. You know, everyone says it's hard to control the internet, but some people are doing a pretty good job of trying to control the internet, largely through the intimidation, arrest, and trial of bloggers, tweeters, and all the rest. What's what's the current scene? Well, it's different everywhere. I mean, that's I think always one of the key things about the Middle East. There's no, no place is the same as another. Uh, the Turkish situation is fascinating because um, 
first of all, that combination that you so actually ac accurately point out does want to harken one back to the situation that Mubarak had with the elephants going in and the camels <laughs> as you know Al Jazeera's <laughs> online system is is you know beaming the pictures out. Um, there's a great deal. I think one of the stories we've been following a fascinating story. Uh, in our work um, that is less understood is how much the governments are themselves internet savvy and in fact their greatest threat is not arresting bloggers and putting them on trial. It is hitting them with trolls, hitting them with uh, Twitter um, um, handle um, they're stealing the handles. They've got, you know, a list of different intimidations online that also will lead to misunderstandings of who's who, you know, manipulating identities. Certainly, we we heard earlier at the time of the Arab Spring, before the Arab Spring, but now he was manipulating all sorts of aspects of Facebook identities. This has gone exponential. So it is a very dangerous world out there in terms of just manipulating what you see or understanding what you see. But it's very difficult, and the Moroccans, I think, have found this uh, very much, and I think they're typical, of closing down sites. Because, yes, a lot of sites go dark on a rolling basis, but new ones show up on a rolling basis. And the sophistication and the, I mean, it's sort of like guerrilla warfare. The moving targets are the, are the in, small groups and the individuals, not the massive government. One of the interesting things is the same kind of thing we're seeing on the ground of these rogue militias that are, for example, the, the Shia militias going into Mosul at the moment, are also very much the way that it's happening online. You've got rogue people supporting all sorts of different sides. Thank you, Roxanne. That was wonderful. Thank you. So next up, uh, Otara Haidar, again, Oxford, who will give us the, uh, her take on Syria. Okay, so my presentation is about Salami and the Syrian War Media, uh, Sites of Civic Education and Civic Society. Uh, the last five years uh, subjected all Syrians, including the Syrian Ismailis, to unprecedented and uh, regular suffering, which is still increasing in intensity. Salamia's uh, region uh, collapsed into a frenzied battleground where different armed groups uh, compete daily to capture it. Uh, its population is living through a uh, daily experience of death, kidnapping, and displacement. Today, the young uh, Salamians are uh, desperately struggling to protect their town and community against the daily violent uh, threats of, uh, and attacks by the armed groups. Uh, the recent estimations uh, state that about 10,000 young men from Salamia lost their lives in different locations, the highest number uh, of whom was in and around Salamia. Several hundred women were kidnapped, enslaved, or held uh, hostages. Um, the daily uh, panics and uh, deterioration of life conditions are increasingly forcing many to leave the area towards different uh, destinations. On the other hand, it is uh, pressuring the rest to work out different ways to survive and help each other. Uh, since the very beginning, this war was accompanied by rise of uh, polemics and uh, a frenzied cultural war uh, on many groups and communities. Uh, in the case of Salami, it took the shape of attacking the Ismaili ministry and symbols. Uh, like with other groups and communities, approaches to deal with uh, this cultural war are diverse. The daily news circulating um, through different mediums, especially the social media, depict elaborately the life in Salami and the different responses of the community to the effects of the war. The social media is the main platform uh, that, that uh, displays the different projects and initiatives in the community. 
Uh, this paper combines empirical research conducted during 20 months spent in Syria and uh, Salamine, uh, especially between 2011 and 15, uh, with data collected by following daily and closely Salamian uh, social media, especially on Facebook and YouTube, and introduced them in the light of modern approaches of cultural studies and ethnographic uh, perspectives. Uh, it provides an internal and in uh, comprehensive view of the Syrian Ismailis and Salamine during the last five years of war that influenced and trans transformed the city and the community. It also explores challenges and, uh, and prospects uh, for them in particular and for Syria in general. <laughs> Um, community pages and uh, uh, news um, uh, services. Yeah, this is the first uh, part of my uh, presentation. Under this level, I can uh, categorize more than 70 pages because I follow more, um, about 50 of them. Uh, even though some of uh, them define themselves in various terms, uh, all these pages highlight their two uh, main uh, tasks uh, repeatedly as news and services, which means reporting on the security situation and providing information about all utilities in the city that have increasingly um, major having increasingly major failures, uh, and they attempt to inform and to advise. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, in terms of the followers and the uh, course of frequency of uh, pub publishing. It's called Salamia Mubashar Salamia Live. Um, this, their position, the, all these pages, is rep represented by the names of these pages and the images and symbols presented on the front pages and in posts uh, such as this page, uh, which is the most popular one. The two features under the Syrian flag are representative of, of ancient and modern Salamia. The castle is Roman and the word welcome was engraved to welcome His Highness um, Aga Khan in his uh, uh, visit to Salamia in 2001. The second one is the uh, monument uh, at the entrance of Salamia, symbolizing the open, hospitable nature of the city and its community. Uh, the second pic uh, picture um, uh, is uh, another attempt to synthesize the ancient Roman to Fatimid and modern Ismaili history on these pages. The one in the middle, this is Imam Ismail's mausoleum, in the middle occupies a central stage in the cultural imaginary. Uh, these monuments consolidate on uh, the other symbols uh, that define the identity of the city and the community. This more, just uh, some of the very um, uh, popular ones and uh, uh, also the most active. Um, uh, although most pages have a brief, brief statements, as you see, they, they just introduce themselves. Um, they are very much self-descriptive in the, in the um, icons and also in, in, in the names. Uh, so they have brief statements and some and minor differences, um, but some pages uh, described in details, uh, in detail themselves, and almost all community pages in varying degrees, uh, like this one. <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, this is this gives. Um, I, I highlighted the uh, things which I thought important: news about security situation, services, and uh, open pharmacies, like 24 uh, hours, and the complaints and concerns, etc. Uh, uh, to some extent, this describes uh, all um, uh, all the uh, other pages, community pages. Um, uh, with the escalation of conflicts, uh, many pages that had a specific theme, uh, like this one, uh, Salamian Youth Gathering, um, uh, and the one for business, and that is weather, and this is the uh, uh, for immigrants and uh, expatriates. Uh, so, uh, however, uh, uh, all these pages um, uh, and forums, uh, even uh, the weather, they shift their main focus to news and services. Um, for example, social pages uh, were initially established for socializing with existing friends. Uh, they still keep a space for social networking in which uh, followers uh, share ideas, posts, digital photos, and videos. Uh, these pages inform um, others about social and cultural um, activities and events in Salami. They also <coughs> enable people to connect with other members in the diaspora. So, so they, they, they all shift uh, their uh, main um, uh, themes. As obvious uh, from their self description and active communication, all these pages report the news of uh, services and facilities, uh, the failure and restoring of utilities, especially water, electricity, and internet, distribution of subsidized gas and the fuel, road safety advices, markets, uh, price um, rises, and shortage of food and medicine. These 
they just uh, define marginalization of their community and the dis destructive effects of the war by working like a citizen bureau or a help desk that uh, provide uh, support and information and respond quickly to inquiries concerning these issues. They mediate with official institutions, submit uh, complaints, uh, form pressure groups, create uh, petitions and send letters. Uh, these pages on uh, Facebook are the most common source for news of Salamia and its countryside and for Salamians everywhere in Syria and abroad. They are uh, directed to local audience, but a great deal of the dedicated followers uh, are from the community members around Syria and abroad. Uh, they compensate for a poor coverage of national media, very much lacking in quantity and quality, and they make irrelevant other sources which can be uh, conflicting and misleading. Uh, they enjoy high rates uh, of followers across all generations of uh, literate adults. Uh, when asked, when asked, uh, uh, I asked about uh, 100 people. More than 90% of them reported getting political news about their city and community on these pages. However, more than half of these, mostly older users who have more dedicated news habits, rely on local, regional, and international TV channels um, to keep up with what is going uh, out uh, on out of ceremony. Uh, each page has a group of mostly young, educated, IT competent of volunteers working as administrators and correspondents. Female admins and correspondents are active and up to 50% of some of them. These pages pro proliferated in 2013 and 14 with the escalation of conflicts uh, around Salamia. Uh, they provide 24 hours um, news, coverage of the security situation in the city and the breaking the news of clashes in the close uh, surrounding, <coughs> information about casualties, names of the dead, injured, and missing, <coughs> advice for public during security crisis, and accidents, uh, calls uh, for blood donation, and coverage of the funeral. Uh, what is more, they try to give moral support and collective and individual counseling during a crisis and public panic, uh, like this, for instance. <coughs> Um, the second half of this, so this is about the uh, pages and news and services. The second half of my presentation is about cultural organizations and societies. Uh, some of these organizations were founded before the war by groups of intellectuals and artists and educators, and others developed, uh, re developed recently. However, both responded to the crisis by developing uh, policies, programs, projects which are uh, socially relevant to the community. In the last few years, they contributed to many uh, projects of social development, such as courses in uh, first aid, family health, and uh, responding to mass accidents. This one. Um, it was delivered in Salamia by the Association of Syrian Churches. Um, uh, the, so they are independent. These cultural um, societies and organizations, they are independent institutions. However, they cooperate with official administrations, the Ismaili councils, AKDN, and different humanitarian and volunteers groups, and the local community. Uh, examples of uh, these uh, cultural organizations and society uh, are these, the um, most uh, uh, or so active ones. And uh, this section will look into the work of the, um, maybe I'll concentrate on the last three, which are the biggest and most popular, and concentrate on some specific aspects of their activities, namely those um, that contributed to expand the role of uh, civic uh, education and civil society during the ongoing war. Yeah? They are very active in many aspects, so this is uh, concentrating only about one aspect of their work. I divide it into two, uh, these aspects. Um, uh, I call the first one the uh, community memories. Um, there is an awareness among Salamians that uh, sharing photos, videos, and sounds uh, is a cultural practice that can strengthen collective identity and that visual collective memories can bring the community together in times of crisis and cultural division. The ability to create community, uh, a community archive is no longer the work of librarians, thanks to the support of the uh, IT competent uh, members of these organizations. These organizations directed a call to share the visual history of the community and Salamia and participate in projects to preserve it for future users. They regularly publish old photos, and they also publish a historical calendar, uh, uh, organized an exhibition, and are building an archive. The community responded with enthusiasm, and photos are generously lent from private collections. These images are regarded as both private and public, indicating that the meaning of memory and identity is changing. 
publishing a photo <laughs> on their pages uh, is usually followed by a discussion about the context, which often turns into an attempt to write a, sh a shared history. Visual memories and their supporting narratives are collectively gathered, revised, preserved, and con consumed. The viewers are part of the story and are intimately linked through their engagement with the photos and the story. These memories acquire additional value because they are digitized and shared. This process is more than just archiving because it involves the power of knowledge and the participation uh, in guarding the collective identity and history. Uh, more? And yeah, this is from the uh, actually taken from uh, the historical calendar, which uh, published uh, and also for, for, uh, published on their websites. Uh, in their comments and discussions, they uh, the um, uh, uh, people who are participating um, and uh, viewing these pages narrate the memories of the community, especially their struggle for survival in crisis and harsh environment. They dig deep into the collective uh, history to uh, unravel the great prototypes of their culture. Uh, in addition to the usual pictures, people share videos, personal footage, footages, uh, Salamiya now, Salamiya earlier, uh, nostalgia uh, to old times, picnics, uh, and um, community events. The clips are uh, accompanied by the, a sentimental song or a voiceover that show how Salamiya is precious to its people. You can find some of uh, examples on YouTube, uh, just if you put uh, in the search Salamiya. Uh, the last section uh, of my presentation is youth group, and um, sport, art, and education. Uh, the high cultural capital of the city is presented in the public interest of its community in art and sport. The pain and hardship did not stop the outpouring of creativity in different mediums and genres. The current art production articulates the communal uh, emotions of fear and loss as well as resilience and hope. Uh, their visual arts and creative entertainment is not only a therapeutic and healing process, uh, as obvious uh, in their uh, discussions in, on social media, films and street theater are a space to raise uh, urgent issues and to further the dialogue on in the social media after and beyond. These cultural organizations provide a forum for teachers, instructors, and people of all ages, especially youth and um, uh, children, to meet and share best uh, practices of art and sport. These organizations work closely with both art societies and sports clubs to create a ground for young, uh, like-minded people to meet, discuss their aspirations, uh, put plans, and support the community. Uh, these organizations encourage active involvement of school educators, both uh, current and retired, to promote the role of the visual arts in education and appreciation of cultural expression. Uh, this organization hosted, uh, sponsored, and supported many many successful initiatives and uh, projects for volunteers. Among the uh, initiatives and projects that are um, established at the hands of young cultural groups and uh, supported by these organizations are these uh, that you, you see here: uh, cleaning and uh, um, creating gardens, uh, uh, painting the school walls, um, uh, etc. And the last one is an um, exhibition, handicraft, and uh, uh, painting by uh, children of special need, and there is also um, a, a lecture uh, about that. Many established athletes, artists, and journalists are key players in the groups of volunteers <coughs> and integrate them with energy and team spirit. The work of these groups include collecting donated clothes and food for poor families, installing lights around the city, cleaning the uh, squares and streets, planting, uh, planting trees, and creating the new parks. These organizations advocate uh, values of social justice, such as the full participation of women and support of people of special needs, uh, learning difficulties, behavior disorder, and physical impairment. Um, uh, the social uh, media provides a platform for uh, different initiatives and programs which are primarily community-based. It also helps to transmit uh, values and norms of civil work and education. It proves that learning and teaching are not limited to schooling, but to but a lifelong process the public participation in the planning and engagement in management uh, are also forms of civic education. So one paragraph uh, conclusion. Uh, now, uh, these are volunteer group. I like this one. These are uh, during the break, children trying to uh, play and take part. It's important to note that new media competencies developed together with the new understanding of social participation and civic education. This cultural, out cultural output presented on social media sheds light on the interaction of these 
individuals and the groups with the crisis and on their own modes of resistance and of struggle for survival. Their cultural production, which is disseminated on the platform of social media, represents a strong counter discourse to the binaries and stereotypes that were established by the war and its parallel media war. Salami and the Ismailis prove that what seems to be standing silent on the sidelines is a conscious diverging from the current standardized patterns of political activism toward, towards uh, peaceful activism, activism and civil society. Their classical and modern cultural sources are among their main inspirational sources for their models and the project of social work and civil uh, education in their city and community. We have a question here in the front. Thank you, this was very interesting. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the news uh, blog, blog, like the news yes. aspect of it, and especially with the discussion forums. Is there, is there uh, basically a deliberation, some kind of uh, exchange of um, different opinions on what is happening um, in Syria? Do people, uh, let's say, feel comfortable criticizing uh, the regime or perhaps uh, like just not, not necessarily criticizing the regime, but uh, debating each other about different interpretations um, in regards to what is happening in Syria. Um, especially with your conclusion about it being kind of a, a different kind of, of activism, um, how do you basically, uh, how, how would you argue against an interpretation that this is more like a, escapism or perhaps uh, just because there is there is no alternative to have mm -hmm. different opinions. Yes, you need to live in Salania to be able to maybe understand because maybe it's very difficult for you to understand what I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, I think the main uh, thing that uh, control the whole scene is the panic. There is public panic. Uh, I go there for a week and I can't sleep at night. I don't know how they sleep actually, but all the night I'll be sitting in the chair. I try to, to, sleep, to, to sleep in the chair. The, but I, um, when I'm in Damascus, I feel more safe. But there because, uh, you know, in the, uh, during the day there is, uh, for instance, papers thrown that the city will be taken, for instance, today. And every day there is uh, lots of funerals. Um, so the, the main thing that's operating now the politics of uh, trying to survive the, the community uh, also may be difficult for you to understand because these communities had to struggle for survival for centuries. So they, they, have, they, they are bringing that also experience to be able to survive. It is very difficult, I think, for outsiders to, um, to, to except if they are very, very well versed in ethnography, I think, to understand what many communities in Syria, they, they, these voices are very much suppressed and what is controlling the scene is a media that won't, they, as, I, as I said, like certain um, uh, activism, criticizing and changing. Uh, there, is, there is part, of course, there is uh, lots of criticism. For instance, when I say there is petition and there is lots of criticism, but it is, um, uh, uh, they have also their own um, uh, way uh, dealing with the crisis. They want to survive. Todd, we have one more question from the back here. Okay. And then we'll segue to our next presenter. First of all, I want to say thanks for this very vivid portrait of, of a place of the people we don't hear about. Um, and, um, here, here. Sorry? Here, here. Yes. <laughs> um, and also civic engagement. We don't, I mean, academics are writing about it, but it has kind of fallen off the, off the, off the media uh, radar. Um, uh, just two quick questions. One, you mentioned that younger media users tend to limit themselves to local, you know, sort of local non-professional media mm -hmm. that, that's happening now in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. um, and older viewers do look, look at, also look at, at conventional mm -hmm. um, um, professional media. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if you had an interpretation of that or if you, uh, an idea of why that might be. Um, the second one um, is... Can, we're running out of time. Let's stick to the first question here. <laughs> So, uh, Ohara, take, take the floor for just a minute. Yes, I think people who, um, as I said, um, um, adults who have more dedicated habits on following news, they still look. However, as I said, it's for uh, news out of Salami. For news in Salami, you can't get it anywhere in the world except in the, inside the community. Nobody reports about what is going in, inside Salami. 
I'm seeing about Salimi as just the example. It's not the only, I think some other communities also maybe go through the same, but maybe Salimi is the most vulnerable one in terms of the time and, the, uh, it's, it's, um, and also uh, the, their cultural diversity. Uh, they were very much highly politicized. It is uh, Salimi, one of the most uh, um, highly politicized um, uh, communities in Syria. So they followed the news. They, they need to, to know maybe what, what's going around the world. This is very much Salamian habits. So they had to get that from uh, uh, BBC New World Service or uh, France 24. They are very popular there. Yeah? But the young ones, I think they rely only because they got into the habit. So they, they actually, even this news, they will go into these websites of, uh, of like, um, uh, uh, yes, Western websites. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. And our final presenter, just to remind you who she is, this is Bahar Joya. She is a practicing BBC <laughs> journalist, comes to us from the Reuters Institute, and will talk to us about Afghanistan. Thank you for having me in this program at uh, AKU. Uh, so the topic I'm going to present is about uh, social taboos in Afghanistan and social media in the hand of women to break social taboos and fight against social taboos. Uh, okay. I hope I don't struggle with this. I choose this picture because I think this is the most popular picture and face of women for everybody from Afghanistan. Uh, so, new levitation. Uh, this is the topic which I uh, have done the research on that in Oxford during my stay there in three months. So we have uh, ways of communication. First of that is the introduction of social media, and then uh, we have the background and methodology and findings and the limitation which I was facing during conducting this uh, uh, research. And first of all, social media is roughly defined as a group of internet-based applications, uh, I just got to pass the social media, change of communication with the time for Afghan women. From late 90s, we uh, go to Afghan society. Uh, women were not allowed to be in the society massively in, in, in different provinces and uh, uh, except Kabul. So most of the communication was like in the gathering personal gathering or uh, maybe in the uh, weddings or in the funerals. That was the only place that women could talk to each other and communicate with each other and know each other. So, and there was le less changes which happened in late 90, which I'm going to that phrase uh, for some times. So from 2001, a massive change happened to women's life in Afghanistan with the mobile phone for the first time, although uh, they had access to the uh, other type of uh, phone, but it was only in the hand of man. But from 2001, which the Nokia phone came in Afghanistan, so some of the women, they got to have their own mobile phone, and they were owning that. But still, these were particular women who was working in the society as a teacher, as a doctor, or uh, as a journalist. Uh, it was very less women who could have access to the mobile phone in every part of the country. Mostly this happened in Kabul from 2001 after Taliban regime. And then in 2006, when women were able to have access to the internet and have their own uh, users, and for the first time they used to have uh, messengers, Yahoo messengers, and they used to create their own uh, users and it was hidden from the families because the society was very conservative and still nobody was ready to uh, accept that, that his wife, his daughter or any female member of the family should have access to this because it would connect them to their world and they get to know what's happening. And the uh, history of women, which I was interested to come here, and their struggle. Uh, the first picture is uh, from King Amanullah, and it's showing the women with uh, Western dress. And this is women belongs to King's family, elite's family, and uh, some ministers from uh, again from King's family. And 
this change happened only again in late 90 in Kabul. So it was the first time uh, a group of women went to Turkey for higher education. And during King of Women Law, we had the first female magazine, which was uh, uh, owned by Mahmoud Terzi and his wife, Asma Terzi, was the author for this magazine. They used to cover most of the stories about women and women's education. And King was uh, encouraging women to go abroad. But that is still, it again remained in big cities in a specific people and groups. Uh, but, uh, okay, I have the dates here with me. The People Democratic Parties, which is uh, from 1978 to 1992, it's, again, just showing women's dress uh, in the Kabul, and these are ordinary people. And this is the time which uh, a very massive change happened in the life of women not only elite groups, but ordinary people, everybody was able to practice the freedom. And for the first time, they introduced TV. And we had women as a presenter, as a singer, as a news reader in the TV. And uh, we saw the picture of women. Although we had during uh, uh, 1970s uh, women in, in the radio, voice of women only. But in 1978 to 1992, women came in the society massively, everywhere. And then uh, from 1997 to, uh, from 1992 to 1997, which is Mujahideen and Taliban period, this is called in Afghanistan the darkest uh, uh, era of women, for women. Because during Mujahideen, uh, they, they suppressed women, and uh, <coughs> lots of freedom was cut off from women. But still, uh, we had women as a teacher. We had women as a doctor. We had women uh, in different parts of the society. But from 1997, which is Taliban's period, women was removed from every part of social activities, absolutely. And only we had few doctors in the cities, in the big cities, to serve women. And they were uh, able to provide health uh, services to women only. So there was no woman, no education, no school, nothing absolutely during this time, which we call it dark period for women. During Karzai's period, which is started from 2001, and I think everybody uh, remember Afghanistan from this state more. Here, if you can see the, uh, a new gate open to all women in Afghanistan, and with the presence of international community, there were lots of attention they paid on, uh, they uh, tried to pay on women's situation, because women remained for a decade backward in the houses. Uh, they were not uh, allowed to go outside, they were not allowed to study or school or anything. So we have lots of international organization to protect women and promote women. So from this time we have women in, in army, we have women as a police, we have women in social gatherings, in schools and university, and here uh, in this picture, this is an MP in Afghanistan, her name is Fauzia Kufi and she wrote it book as well about this, uh, her uh, uh, memories. And this is the first women judge after Taliban's period. And she was judge in West of Afghanistan in Herat province for a decade. And uh, that is Sima Samar, head of, uh, of uh, um, uh, human, uh, human Rights Commission in Afghanistan. And the, the research which I conducted about the Social media, it was a brief uh, background. Uh, it's from interviews which I took at a uh, sample size of 100 people, 100 women I interviewed. They're using social media and uh, 50 men and the journals and uh, other things which I used during this time. So the finding was very interesting for me because uh, I, as a journalist, it was very easy for me to have access to different people and contact them. 
And I was thinking that during this time, uh, women are having access to massive kind of information. So everybody is having smartphones. They must have their users, and they must have access to the social media. But actually, when I start doing this, and start searching women, I found that very less women are having access to the social media, especially women who are women activists, or uh, they are working as a social services, or in international organization, or uh, journalists. And they are not so much. And most of them are in Kabul again, not in the provinces. So women Facebook users. From the 100 women which I talk to them, uh, I uh, through Viber, through WhatsApp, and through uh, Skype, and some of them, when I was in Afghanistan, I interviewed them face to face. Put their photos. Don't put their photos. What does it mean? Uh, in Afghanistan, we have lots of users with fake IDs, or women who are not using their real picture in the Facebook, or their real name in the Facebook. So 20% of them are putting their photos, and 80% they don't put their real photos in the Facebook. So if you are going to uh, uh, social media pages in Afghanistan, you are not sure the person you are communicating is the real or not, or is she a woman or not. And from this 20%, all of them, and exceptionally, are the victim of violence, any type of violence. Like, for example, uh, they got threatened in their social media pages, <coughs> or people have used them, or they try to disturb them, because we don't have a particular law or regulation to protect people. Because social media is still very, very young in Afghanistan, and we don't have anything in the law about it. That if I'm facing threats from a particular group, where I should go, how I should seek uh, protection. And the police, uh, they are all proud. <laughs> so fight against taboos, again, uh, which was shocking for me. From this 20% of women, again, only 10% of them were saying that we fight against social taboos. And what is considered as a social taboo in Afghanistan? In the most uh, conservative country in the region, I think. Um, I consider as a, a social uh, taboo. My appearance. Uh, my interaction with man is a social taboo. Uh, if I talk about my rights, it's still taboo. It's not acceptable to the society although we have a very protective law, but it's not uh, implemented. Don't fight against 90% of them. They don't fight against social taboos. And what they are doing in the social media? They're just reading the news. Uh, they're sharing the news. They are uh, trying to talk to the people. Most of them are not using their real names, so they are protected. So they can make friends and, 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 and use this as a, something very interesting, colorful. And in the fourth slide, real name, but no real picture. 30% of them, they say that we are putting our real name. This is Bahar, but not the real picture. And the 70%, no real name, no real picture in the social media from this 100 women which I talked. So the positive uh, uh, finding which I got through this interviews, how social media is helping Afghan women, and uh, in which case that's helping them. They told me that social media is helping us to find, to, sorry, to fight against uh, uh, violence, because Afghanistan have, has the uh, major violence against women. If you go to the news about Afghanistan, every day you will find a news that somebody killed his wife, somebody uh, killed his sister, or domestic violence, or uh, many things. So social, social media united all the women to fight against all these kind of acts and enforce the system of justice. For example, if you remember Fasunda's case, she was accused to burn Quran in Kabul, and she was killed by a mob killing in, in France. Uh, it was only two kilometers away from presidential palace in front of the police forces. 
And unfortunately, I was one of the witnesses in that incident. I was on my weekend. I went to beauty parlor, and I was coming, and I saw a massive people are just shouting, and I didn't know what's happening. When I asked, they said, maybe there is a, another explosion. I said, then why they're not are running away? And everybody's there. And I, suddenly, I saw something is rolling in the street. And I saw it's a woman. And I tried to go and help. I tried to ask help from police, and they just hold me. And I, all I could do at that moment is to cry and shout and ask for help, and nobody helped her until she died in front of my eyes. And then I came to office, and it was 7 PM in the night. And I sat on my computer, and I wrote the news. And I sent it to London. I said, this happened today in front of me, which used to happen in Europe maybe in uh, 14th century. <laughs> so this, this is what, again, social media played a very important role to share all share that news, uh, to force the government to arrest those people, and and follow up the, the courts, and uh, it was it was effective, and again I show a different face of Afghan women to the world, because everybody knows about Afghanistan. They are backward. The society is very conservative. Women are suppressed in the houses, but there is a very less. Uh, movement and a change which is happening there. And you can see it through social media, which they are active and interact with the men. They can, uh, some of them are getting engaged with men through social media, although it's hidden from their family, but still. It's giving them that courage to talk to a man and, and, and express themselves. Uh, and stop harassment and many types of, and finding from men Perception. I talked to the 50 men uh, in this research, and most of them uh, were educated, and they are employees of the government, international organizations. Five minutes. Sure. <laughs> uh, it was very interesting for me. 25% of them said that we are uh, agree with all aspects of women activities in social media, and 75% they said we are not agree. And when I asked how you are angry with all aspects of women's activity in the social media, they said, look, uh, Afghanistan is having lots of problems, political issues and economical issues. Nobody cares women what they are. Oh, Nobody is going to uh, listen to them. So it's not important for me what they are doing in the social media. But the 75% they said, no, they should not. Women should know their limitation. They should know the culture. They should know the society. And according to that, they should move on and it is the platform is still not ready for them to uh, break these taboos. And then men respond on women activity on social media, real name, but no real picture, no real name. Okay. And 30% of them say that I allow my wife to have a Facebook page with her real name, but she should pick my put my picture or my son or anything except herself. I said, why? And they said, because uh, this, the society is not safe. If somebody sees my wife, he can comment on that. I can't accept that. So this is what happened. And 70% said, no real name, no real picture. Why women should you use social media? I'm, I'm getting lots of girlfriends from different parts of the world. If, if somebody comments on my woman, then what will happen? If my wife became friend with somebody, I have a girlfriend from India, for example. <laughs> so, my woman will know this all. I don't want her to be in the in this picture at all. And uh, these are some pictures about women. They are, like, for example, what is social taboo? Talking about your period, period pay. In Afghanistan, it's considered as a taboo. If woman is suffering from that, she even cannot speak <coughs> about it, and she cannot go to doctor, and she cannot complain that I'm having pain, and. Everybody is saying that just be silent. It is, it's not very good to talk even about it. And these are the women that are fighting social taboos by appearing here. She is celebrating the win of Real Madrid. And she's putting her picture with a smile, fighting against violence like this. This is one of the women who was beheading by his, her husband. And then it was a massive campaign against this incident in 2015, I think. And they arrested the man. And this is the woman 
with the real name and real picture, but she's an MP. So anyhow, everybody knows her. It's not very easy to put all this. And the limitation which I was facing, data from the people, it was very difficult when I was interviewing women. They were very scared that how I'm going to use this data, or where I'm going to use that. If their names come, what, then what will happen to their family? Two minutes. OK. And men and women not ready to talk because of the society. And the time was very less for me. Uh, and, the, the, and the chances of manipulation in response to a question, especially from men, when I was talking to their own women, they were not ready to answer that. And I was suffering a lot to give my answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bahar. Um, we have a few minutes for some questions. Anybody? Should I wait? I'd, I'd wait. Yes, in the, in the back here and then over on the side. Okay. Hi, thank you for that. Fascinating. Um, I'm particularly intrigued by um, your interview with the men. With the men. Hmm. I mean, I was wondering, I know you say your sample size is small, so I'm just asking you for a kind of anecdotal feel if you have a sense that there are patterns between it, uh, among the responses you got from men. Patterns that, due to, uh, that had to do with age, region, uh, educational background, anything like that. Uh, yes, uh, about the men. About the man. About the man. Yes. Some were conservative, some not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, I considered that during I was talking to them, so they are coming from different backgrounds. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, some of them were working in in, in uh, uh, government uh, departments, and some of them from international organizations, and some of them from different provinces, and they had uh, different ideology about. Uh, uh, women's freedom. I, I choose that too. It should be varieties of men, not all democratic men. And over here on the side. Yeah, I wanted to know, thank you very much for your presentation, first of all. Uh, about networking among women mm -hmm. uh, within Afghanistan, not so beyond. So do they uh, network with other Afghan women who live abroad on, on these issues and whether activism Yes, yes. Actually, uh, women in Afghanistan in the social media, mostly they are having a very strong contact with the women who are living abroad, for example, in Europe and US uh, during Farfunda's incident. So uh, we were able to organize lots of demonstrations outside of Afghanistan, again, through social media activities <coughs> and give awareness about this incident. Uh -huh. I just wonder whether you found that any um, connection between education levels among men and women and their attitude, well, men in particular, and their attitude towards women. In other words, did it seem to be more enlightened mm -hmm. uh, the more educated the men were, or did it make no difference? Uh, uh, I want to say my personal uh, experience about this. I think it would be in a fair. Uh, I brought up in a family which my father is a general in army. He got education uh, from Russia. He is a communist. And uh, my mother is a principal in a school. And I was reading like books from Marx when I was 13. And I was reading books of Nietzsche and, and, and postmodernism when I was 18. Because there was lots of books in the home. And he was not allowing me to go out and play with the kids. And he was saying that, yes, you can study anything. You can criticize anything. And when I entered the university, I was a student of Sharia law. Uh, but uh, when it comes to his reputation and, and, and challenging with the society, with conservative society, he was the first person who stopped me and who walked against me and said, you have no right to talk, to write, or to be a parent on uh, TV. I, I, I'm working for the BBC, and I'm I was living alone in Kabul because my family was against me, because I was not wearing scarf, and people was criticizing him, and he was not ready to answer that. So it doesn't matter if they are educated. Doesn't matter if what kind of ideology they are following, but they are from that society, and until they are living there, they are like them, all of them. 
Do you think? Do you think? I mean, that presumably took not very long, over a few years ago. Are there any signs that that's changing? Uh, of course. Uh, during this past 15 years in Afghanistan, uh, lots of money came in Afghanistan. Lots of investment on women's rights, mm -hmm. and uh, I think Afghan men they are very clever and intelligent. How to betray international community by paying attention on women's rights, women's education, gender equality. They have on the paper everything to show you to get the fan, but actually when you are going, we don't have women in the leadership, in the media. We don't have women uh, anywhere still. The violence against women is increasing every year if you see the average. So we are there spending this much money and how they are changing the society. The only thing which is changed is women themselves. They are fighting and they are saying no to these violences. And one last question in the back there on the side. Oh, sorry, maybe two if you're really quick. Uh, you were saying that you were know, using the uh, Facebook or uh, these uh, networks to really fight against this discrimination or this thing. Yeah. How does, what shape does this fight take? Uh, what form? Uh, what kind of fight? Like, like how we fight? You, which, you, you, which you interpreted as fighting against the against, circumstances? Yes. Uh, for example, we say no to compulsory hijab. And we put our picture without hijab on our social media pages and we say we don't accept this. This is a fight. And the last question here. It's a little bit related to what you are talking now. So I've been following the Iranian uh, activists through uh, Facebook and I saw how they have very uh, strong networks with the uh, Iranians outside, uh, Iranian woman is very revolutionary woman. And they thought that uh, if uh, a woman put a picture without a job, that the government could take her to prison or, you know, it's a lot of difficulty. Yes. So uh, I wonder if this is happening in Afghanistan and how do you find it comparing with the Iranian yeah. woman? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, fortunately, in Afghanistan, we don't have anything compulsory of a job in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the law. So the law is very modern because uh, the constitution has been made in 2003, I think, the new one. And uh, they guarantee every rights for everybody. But because of the corruption, and second, because the the potential of being conservative in that country is very, very high. So it's completely different from Iran. In Iran, people themselves, they're Democrats. They want freedom. Uh, but in Afghanistan, it's not like that. Law is not making me to wear hijab. There's nothing in the, in the constitution in Afghanistan. But the, the, the society is making me to do that. Well, thank you for a wonderful panel. That was very, very interesting.